Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our forum on war and peace. My name is Peter Wahl. I am the moderator of this panel, and uh, some elder among you might know me. I have been involved uh, quite actively in the foundation of Attack and served the first eight years in the board. Uh, but I'm not uh, the issue of this panel, so uh, I want, uh, before we start, to settle the question of translation. It is the same procedure as in the other fora as well. We will speak here on the panel and uh, with our friends who are per video connected with us uh, in English. Uh, so I, in order to facilitate the work for the interpreters, will also do so, although I'm not British. Uh, and with one exception, uh, we have one German speaker. I will now present our speakers for our panel. Uh, first of all, we have in New York, Tarja Kronberg. Is, can you hear me, Tarja? There is an internet connectivity issue. Uh, anyhow, I will present her. Maybe uh, we can settle the problem. Uh, Tarja Kronberg comes from Finland. Uh, she is an associate fellow of CIPRI, the Stockholm Institute for Peace Research. It is probably the most prominent peace and conflict research institute in the world. She is also a member of the delegation of Finland uh, at the negotiations uh, for the um, Treaty on Non-Proliferation. This is why she is in New York at the moment. She had agreed to come here, to be physically here, uh, but then she was assigned as member of the delegation of her country in uh, the negotiations in New York. I hope uh, it will be possible uh, that she solves the connectivity problem with the internet. This is our first panel participant. Our second uh, participant is physically here. I'm very glad to welcome Sarah Mehdi Jones. She is director of the UK campaign for nuclear disarmament. Um, and uh, I think uh, in case Tarja continues with the problem, Sarah will be the first to speak. Sec uh, thirdly, we have uh, here, and this has worked, and it's fantastic, Yuri Shelyazhenko. He is in Kiev. Uh, he is a teacher uh, teaching at the uh, Kiev University. He is uh, an expert in law, and he is in the International War Resisters League. Yuri is a true pacifist, and we think that talking about war and peace is not possible uh, without speaking about pacifism as one of the very old traditions uh, from Kant uh, <laughs> through Victor Hugo until our new time. So, Yuri, welcome. We are very happy that you are also in Kiev with us here in Mönchengladbach. Thank you for invitation. And finally, uh, there has been a slight change in the program. Our participant, which initially wanted to come, Claude Serfati, unfortunately has inform informed us very short notice that he is not capable to come. Uh, so we have found uh, somebody who replaces him not just uh, as an emergency solution, but somebody who is really very much involved in questions of war and peace. I welcome Roland Appel from Bonn and Cologne. Uh, he is um, the president of the Radikal Demokratische Stiftung in German, uh, in, in English it's Foundation for Radical Democracy. Uh, which is uh, an offspring of the social liberal times in Germany long ago. He was for the liberal youth uh, president and uh, at the same time he is today member of the Green Party. Uh, so these are our panelists and before we start now, I wanted to say two sentences about uh, the context in which we are discussing this issue. A war, and if it is close 
to our doors a war is an extreme and exceptional event. Uh, everything changes through war. The human costs, uh, the breakage of law, of international law, of human rights, etc., are very tremendous. So it is very understandable that in times of war, emotions are very strong. It is also an experience with wars. Since 1914, in the progressive and left movements, that war has always split these movements, parties, and so on. In 1940, the Social Democratic Party of Germany voted for the war, with one exception, only one person, an extreme minority, Karl Liebknecht, was voting against it. But then it was also splitting the second international. There was only one party at that time which did not agree. It was the, Rus the Russian Social Democratic Party, uh, where the majority was against participating in the war. By the way, in Russian, majority means Bolsheviki. So, after that, it was a deep break in the labor movement, in the progressive forces, in the left parties, uh, which had historical consequences over many decades and a long time. So, you see, this split was very important. We have seen the same with the Iraq war and others. Why do I mention these historical experience? We have today, with the war in Ukraine, a same and similar situation. Whatever the different streams of thinking in the left and the progressive might think about it, we should see that there was historically always this a reason for a split. And I hope that we manage here today and in the near future, that it does not split us, that we are capable and remain capable to discuss with each other in order to maintain unity and to see the common points which we have. And this is, I think, uh, a peaceful future for us all. So this just for an introduction. And... Uh, And given uh, that Taria is not ready, is that right? She is? I am okay, I am okay if, you, if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much, Taria, and welcome. Uh, we are happy that uh, you have managed your technical problems. And if you agree, I have already presented you, so I will not lose time again to do that. Thank you very much that you uh, are with us. And I will start immediately the discussion now with you and would ask you the question, Taria. Uh, you are in New York as part of the Finnish delegation in the, in the negotiation on nuclear non-proliferation. Could you explain us in five minutes the essence of these negotiations and what could be their possible link to the present conflicts and wars in our world? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty was uh, uh, negotiated in the 60s, basically by by Soviet Union and and, uh, and the US, and uh, it actually uh, defines how to manage the nuclear order and the nuclear weapons in the world. It's called the cornerstone of the nuclear order. Uh, essentially, it it gives five countries the right to have nuclear weapons. Russia is one of them, uh, Britain, uh, France, China, and um, the US. And, and this uh, treaty is called the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and it, it is meant actually to prevent that other countries don't get nuclear weapons. But it also has a clause on disarmament so that um, disarmament should take place and we should sort of have a way forward to a nuclear weapon-free world. So in this treaty, 
At the same time as it prevents the spread of nuclear weapons, it is supposed also to eliminate the nuclear weapons. Now, uh, each five years, it was established in, in 1970, and each five years there's a five-year review conference. And now what is happening right now in New York is that it has this review conference is taking place uh, during August month, the whole month. There have been people speaking, uh, even Putin has sent a message and and uh, <clears throat> the supposed result is a, is a common consensus document, a final report, which sort of would define the situation in, in relation to nuclear weapons and the nuclear order. Now, uh, what what is happening now is that uh, there's a lot of discussion. There's a, a very heavy conflict because of the Russian nuclear threats. It is uh, very seldom that nuclear threats are issued at, at the time of a, a current war, ongoing war. Nuclear threats take place. Uh, Trump had nuclear threats for North Korea and <clears throat> other countries have uh, threatened with nuclear weapons. But this is unique in the sense that nobody knows whether Russia will actually um, follow up with the threats. And the expert view is that these are nuclear threats. Nuclear threats are essential in the in the nuclear order, they are illegal, but legal only if they support the survival of the country, in this case, Russia. So the Russian nuclear threats are, that have been issued in the war of Ukraine are actually illegal. Now, there is a debate at this meeting in New York, in the United States, that, uh, that uh, I understand that the connection is not very good. I hope you can still hear me. Uh, there's a debate about whether the Russian nuclear threat should be condemned in the report. The uh, Western states, EU, the US have criticized Russia in very, very strong terms. But uh, China, India, many African countries I don't want to uh, support this Russian criticism, not because uh, they don't uh, they criticize the the threats, but also saying that well, other countries are also issuing these threats. So it looks to me that there will not be any. There will be a lot of general talk about earlier commitments, but there will not be any specific condemnation of Russia and Russia's nuclear threats. Okay, thank you. Um, if I may just come in with a slightly broader question, Tarja. Uh, of course. Uh, we have uh, now heard about the nuclear issue. Uh, in general, what would you say? Is there inside steps towards finding a diplomatic and political solution for the war in Ukraine? And what do you think if there is a chance, if there is such a perspective, how could it look like and how could we promote such a diplomatic and political solution? Yes. First of all, it's very difficult to see that there would be any initiative, either from the Ukrainian side or the Russian side, to start negotiations. Both have said that they are not ready for negotiations and, and both are expecting that they will uh, sort of gain military advantages. And you can also say that in both cases, additional resources are being uh, um, uh, sent to, to the war on the Russian side. They have uh, a lot of new resources due to the oil and, and gas sales. And Ukraine, Ukraine is getting new resources from the West in, in terms of arms. So it is a kind of balance and, and the situation seen from the point of view of sort of one of the parties being tired or, or the economy being uh, collapsed. Uh, there's no such uh, provisions right now. What uh, And it's very difficult for 
the Europeans or the, for that matter, for the Chinese, to to try to start a negotiation. There is no sort of leader of a country that could come up and say, "Well, let's try this approach and and let's let's try to see if we cannot." negotiate a solution. The only party that could do that is the United um, Nations. It's neutral party. It could appoint somebody to try to find a solution, to try to see if there was an initiative that could be used in order to start the negotiations. But unfortunately, the United Nations seems to be very powerless in this situation. It is not easy to say Guterres, the general secretary, has just been in Ukraine and 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 there's no proposals, as far as I can see, about a, a negotiated solution. So I think it, uh, what the peace movement and, and you could do is, is just try to push for a negotiated solution, even if there is not a clear initiative you can support. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll come back to you, Daria, in a second round, uh, and I will now. Fine. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I will now ask Yuri in Kiev um, uh, to bring in a different perspective. Yuri, uh, my question is the following: I have read in a German newspaper, very important one, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, the Germans know it well. Uh, about two Ukrainian opinion polls, according to which 10% of Ukrainians would be ready to exchange peace for land. Uh, so they would accept immediately a uh, stop of shooting and killing, even if it costs a uh, territorial price. Now, my question to you uh, as a pacifist is, are there within the Ukrainian society forces, uh, uh, society really forces except you and others who are convinced that the success of a military victory over Russia, uh, this means winning back Donbas, uh, Crimea and so on, and so on uh, is not realistic? And do you see that this tendency, which is shown in these opinion polls, is getting stronger? Uh, you know, um, uh, people who are calling uh, for peace in Ukraine uh, are uh, usually oppressed. Uh, and uh, uh, just one example. Uh, one uh, young woman student, uh, uh, first time in her life, uh, uh, made uh, anti-war post in social network uh, and uh, uh, she was immediately expelled from Bila Tserkva National University uh, and uh, they even wrote on the website of university uh, that uh, people with enemy views uh, are not allowed uh, uh, to study in the university. Uh, uh, if uh, this kind of thing can happen uh, with uh, 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 just a uh, young uh, uh, person, uh, imagine uh, uh, how uh, high are stakes for uh, public figures. You know, this current artificially created popular mood to choose strong-handed leadership instead of democracy. No anti-war party could have a floor to advocate peace. Only the war mongering party of President Zelensky, servant of the people, have access to media. Situation is the same as in Russia with Putin and his party, uh, united Russia. And churches too, both in Russia and Ukraine, bless war, not call for peace. Only external incentives like stopping weapons supply could change politics of our militarist and democratic regime. Deadly gifts of weapons from NATO countries is one of the incentives which encourages the Ukrainian government to perpetuate the war and cast aside any possibility of peace except total defeat of all Russian troops on Ukrainian territory, including Crimea. Behind this unrealistic pursuit of victory is grim truth that with economic rare of United States, NATO and EU, 
uh, on Ukrainian side, uh, China, Belarus and other uh, Eurasian Economic Union, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, BRICS countries on Russian side, both parties to the conflict uh, could continue the war for indefinite time. Yuri, 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 uh, please a bit slow. happiness for the sake of absolute power and over profits of ruling elites. Uh, Slower. Military, industrial, financial, media, partisan, academic and bureaucratic for monitoring gangsters. Yuri, uh, Yuri, 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 our interpreters uh, ask me that you speak slightly slower uh, okay. because uh, the interpretation becomes then easier for them. So please try to speak slower. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, I will do it. Uh, should I repeat what I said? No, no, I, I think uh, most uh, Germans understand well and the others uh, will also have understood something. So continue, please, but slow. Okay. So uh, if you want peace among people, don't send them guns. Send them textbooks and lecturers on diplomacy and principled negotiations, mediators, peace workers and nonviolent civilian protectors and other humanitarian aid. But remember, it is better to give fish in a rod instead of fish. Also, these deadly gifts of weapons to Ukraine hurt not only Ukrainian and Russian people, but European countries themselves, because their population is robbed of welfare, hopeful future, honest media and genuine democracy to redistribute public funds from butter to guns. And uh, the fact that weapons are supplied uh, through so-called European Peace Fund, European Peace Facility, is disgusting cynicism. It is like uh, a psychotherapist prescribes a patient poison pills to grant him relief from suicidal thoughts. George Orwell foresaw that in dystopian novel uh, called, uh, uh, entitled 1984. In his time, ministries of war well, were called ministries of war, not ministries of defense. He invented uh, a world of three great powers. Uh, with ministries of peace, love, truth, and plenty. Uh, and these ministries are doing the opposite of what their names suggest, in particular Ministry of Peace in charge of eternal war. Read the chapter 3, War is Peace, uh, in Orwell's novel, and you will see how a century ago, uh, near century, uh, Orwell uh, foresaw contemporary world of so-called great powers competition and explained why it is a world of eternal war misrepresented as lasting peace. Uh, returning to moods in Ukraine, uh, which you asked, uh, many people understand that Ukraine is plunged into long-term disaster and six ways to leave the country. Two online petitions to President Zelensky asking him to allow men to travel abroad, now it is prohibited. These petitions gathered 10,000 of signatures. President Zelensky answered to these petitions with rejection and contempt. State Border Guard Service of Ukraine stopped at the border and handed out to recruitment centers more than uh, 6,000 of men, so-called evaders from military mobilization. Since many people enrolled into Western universities, uh, Border Guard stopped uh, to allow uh, uh, students to leave Ukraine, contrary to the law. Uh, in October, military duty and expectantly travel limitations may be uh, more actively extended on women of some professions, or even all, on all women. Uh, there was petition against mandatory military registration of women before Russian invasion, and in response to tens of thousands of signatures was vague, uh, hardly reassuring. Situation is especially problematic because current legislation doesn't allow conscientious objection to military service by military mobilization, contrary to international human rights standards. And several objectors, including uh, a pacifist uh, and a evangelical Christian, were sentenced by courts to three uh, and four years of imprisonment. Uh, maximal sanctions is five years of imprisonment for so-called evasion of uh, military mobilization with replacement of incarceration with probation during a year uh, and three years. Uh, uh, painful procedure, uh, this uh, probation uh, itself, but it means also that they could be summoned to recruitment center again, and after expression of conscientious objection, could be imprisoned uh, for repeated crime. 
So uh, they are sentenced to life in fear and under strict observation uh, just for their belief that killing uh, uh, of people is uh, not allowed and the participation of war, uh, in war is not morally allowed. I hope in future more people in Russia, Belarus and Ukraine will refuse to bear arms and people movement worldwide works to make this happen. I admire braveness of uh, Russian anti-war activists and conscientious objectors uh, who uh, express their views, who refuse to go to army and face severe penalties in Russia. Uh, also, you quoted public opinion poll published by German newspaper, but you should understand context. You know, uh, the same question uh, could be asked in different ways with uh, a hidden appeal to mandatory patriotism or independent critical thinking. According to recent poll of rating sociological group, 64% uh, of respondents believe Ukraine uh, after the current war will regain all territories uh, in its internationally recognized borders, including Crimea and Donbas. Only 54%. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, uh, another 14% uh, say uh, that Ukraine will regain territory controlled uh, before Russian attack in February, which means without Crimea and Donbass. But opinion polls uh, matter something in democratic country. Uh, uh, furthermore, militarism is uh, incompatible with democracy because votes and public discussion mean nothing if you repress dissenters and eliminate opposition. Unfortunately, propaganda of war effort is effective. We have total unconditional trust to army and a mood to choose strong-handed leadership instead of democracy. Level of trust to parliament in Ukraine is 10%, while to President uh, Zelensky, uh, 59%, uh, and to armed forces, uh, uh, 88%. There are ratings uh, like Putin have, and of course it is not natural, it is a result of structural violence. In another recent poll by, by Kiev International Institute of Sociology, 58% uh, of respondents said Ukraine needs a strong hand ruler more than a democratic system. 64% per, uh, uh, of respondents agreed that no criticism of government should be allowed during war. And uh, uh, 48 respondents even said that the government should be allowed to break laws for achieving victory. Paradoxically, the same number of people believe the main problem in the country is uh, corruption. So uh, uh, the most people uh, are, uh, believe government is corrupted, uh, but ready to give absolute power and questioning uh, above the law to this corrupted government. Unimaginable. Uh, if someone will invest billions on introducing cannibalism uh, in food industry, presenting cannibalism as inevitable and necessary in media, and smearing vegetarians, I assure you that 99% of population will say to posters that we need cannibalism more than democracy. It is how uh, these uh, technologies destroying democracy are working. We have in Ukraine some uh, uh, weak and fragile democratic institutions, poisoned and squandered by militarism. But democratic literacy, economic and political culture of the people is very low. Uh, the, that's why democratic education for citizenship should be a first priority. Ukraine, as well as Russia, inherited and preserved Soviet militarism after the dissolution of Soviet Union. It includes inhumane system of military patriotic upbringing and conscription. Civics are hardly taught in schools, and a couple of warmongering uh, NGOs, unknown by people in large, but generously funded by NATO governments, usually describe themselves exclusively as Ukrainian civil society, denying to recognize that all civilians are civil society. Our human rights movement lost historical link with peace movement. Uh, once when signing an open letter of human rights defenders, I proposed to write that war violates human rights. And this uh, proposal was rejected because for all other signatories, uh, uh, except our, uh, our organization, Ukrainian Pacifist Movement, was, uh, uh, war was perceived as something good, uh, as they wrote, uh, in a dimension of values. 
People uh, are taught from childhood to be obedient soldiers, uh, uh, not independent peace-loving citizens and responsible voters. You're right, you're right. Investments into peace education are needed to change it. And that is a way uh, how we will achieve peace. Uh, through uh, knowledge of nonviolent way of life. Yeah, Yuri, uh, you will have uh, the opportunity to speak again yeah, in the next round. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a perspective from Ukraine. <laughs> which was quite different uh, from what we hear normally in our mainstream media. Thank you very much for that. But uh, stay connected, please. We'll come back uh, to you. And I want to raise another issue now with our friend from the United Kingdom, Sarah Mehdi Jones. Uh, if you look at the anatomy of this war, you can see it is for the first time in human history that a nuclear superpower, in that case Russia, is in war with a neighboring country. Past wars of the US, for instance, in Korea, in Vietnam, in Yugoslavia, Iraq, Afghanistan, have always been 10,000 kilometers away. This is a new situation in uh, this war that you can see. And I wonder if this combination of nuclear superpower with the conflict at its own borders is something new, makes a difference, and what are the consequences of that? Thank you very much. Um, before I start on that, just a few words to thank you for inviting me here to the European Summer University. At this unprecedented time of crisis, I think there's nothing more important than cooperation, getting together, understanding each other, opening our minds to different way of doing things. And I think that's what this weekend is all about. And I congratulate you all for organizing it. And I'm particularly pleased to be here as contrary to what 52% of the population of the UK decided, I'm a very proud European, um, used to work in the European Parliament and just think we're all better people from learning from each other. That is how we make things better. So now I work um, for CND uh, as the campaigns director. That's the campaign for nuclear disarmament. That's an anti-nuclear organization based in the UK, responsible over the years for the country's biggest protests against nuclear weapons. But this year and in recent months, we've been more involved in organizing protests against the war in Ukraine and organizing rallies and events to get to the bottom or to try and understand what's happening there. And from the beginning of this conflict, what became clear to us is the many voices concerned about the possibility of this conflict turning nuclear. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that we are the closest to nuclear war than we have been in decades. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, recently warned that the world is just one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. His words should have been a wake-up call to leaders that are pursuing these policies driving the world to nuclear war and to us as populations that aren't taking enough actions, taking enough interest in what could happen with these terrible weapons. So what we see is the international community drifting aimlessly almost into a nuclear conflict. The UN has tried to warn against countries seeking false security by spending vast sums on these doomsday weapons. And Guterres himself said, so far we've just been lucky that nuclear weapons haven't been used again since 1945. But as he also said, luck is not a strategy. We cannot rely on luck to protect us from the risk of the Ukraine conflict turning nuclear. So the question I've been asked by Peter to address has two elements. One is the fact that Russia and Ukraine are neighbors. Now, you would think that the very fact of them being neighbors would make nuclear war less likely, as the impact of a nuclear bomb doesn't stop at any border. The radiation will spread and will have deep impacts on the entire region. But I think the most important aspect of the question is just the nuclear dimension in general, because the real point is that a nuclear war would be fought between Russia and NATO, who between them have around 12,000 nuclear weapons, 
some of these a hundred times the power of the Hiroshima bomb. And the most likely weapons that NATO would use in a nuclear war are already in Europe. This presumably means that initial Russian targets would also be here on the continent. The US chooses to base almost 200 of its nuclear bombs here in Europe, including at the Buchel base in Germany, along with ones in Belgium, in the Netherlands, Italy, and in Turkey. Uh, host countries, very sort of nice term for it, because it's completely against their um, approval. The German Bundestag has even called for their removal, saying we don't want them here, but to no avail. And now, just as things already look to be getting dangerous enough in the east of Europe, the US is bringing more nuclear weapons to the continent and wants to base them in the UK. As well as this, the US is upgrading the bombs that will be based in Germany and elsewhere in Europe. This major increase in NATO's capacity to wage nuclear war in Europe can only be dangerously destabilizing. And I'm not excusing Russia in all this, and I know negotiation with them on anything is very difficult. I'm not going to pretend otherwise, but we have to get real on the nuclear issue in particular. And the positive is that the structures for reducing the nuclear tension does exist in the form of numerous international treaties. This means that we have the right mechanisms in place, the right experts in place to negotiate a climb down from this high nuclear tension. The US and Russia signed New START back in 2010. That was a nuclear arms reduction treaty intended to build trust between the two countries. Russia has suspended the rights of the US to conduct inspections under this treaty just in the last week, but it did make a statement saying, but we'll still comply. I know we can't trust that, but it does show a glimmer of hope about this wanting to negotiate on nuclear issues. So the first speaker joined us live from New York um, and she mentioned the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. This is a country where five of the nuclear states have signed up, 190 countries in total. Again, that is the mechanism to bring down the nuclear risk, even if we can't stop the war overnight. Because I know treaties can seem irrelevant when we're talking about what's going on in Ukraine right at the moment, the atrocities committed specifically on the nuclear aspect, if we don't engage with the serious work of discussion and negotiation, we are just that much closer to disaster. Now, like many of you in this room, I'm sure, um, well, CND, who I work for, we joined people across the world to remember the anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Especially to a younger generation, this can probably feel like a moment in history, something that happened in the textbooks a long time ago. But we must remember the, what happened in, in Japan. We must remember the impacts of a nuclear war and what one would look like today. Even what they call a limited nuclear war means that hundreds of thousands of people would die, including from starvation, as even just a few warheads detonated would affect the environment to such an extent it would cause mass famine. We need to get real and realize these huge impact just a few of these bombs going off would mean. And the sad thing is that for decades now, we've actually seen an improvement in the situation. We've seen gradual reductions in nuclear weapons, both in terms of their total numbers and their individual power. But now we're seeing all nine nuclear armed states going ahead with modernizing or increasing their number of warheads. There are many, many modernizations happening which would make these weapons more dangerous. But worst of all is the sanitization of the idea of nuclear use. Trump had a lot to answer for this. He talked a lot about usable nuclear weapons. I mean, usable nuclear weapons. So what that means is that the idea that they will never be used, this mutually assured destruction that the Cold War was meant to be based on, they're so big, they're so impactful, no one will ever use them, but that's gone. Once we start talking about them in this kind of realistic terms, that means that big taboo has gone. We can't just use a small nuclear weapon on a battlefield and think that everything would be fine elsewhere. This is just nonsense. 
And I know this trend had already started before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but just in the past few months, we've seen plans accelerated, positions hardening. So in a way, I think the fact that the war in Ukraine is actually changing the dimension of the nuclear debate is just as important as the other way around. As part of the negotiations that must one day, whatever happens, come to end the war in Ukraine, an end that we all hope will come soon and without nuclear Armageddon, but when those negotiations come, world leaders must use the opportunity to reevaluate true security and how we define that. We've seen nuclear weapons don't stop war. We, we we're seeing that now, but they do make every conflict and flashpoint much, much more dangerous. Because ultimately, the bottom line is, there's no way to be prepared for that nuclear attack when it comes. We just have to stop it happening in the first place. That should be an urgent task for all of us, because with nuclear arsenals on both sides of this war, we just have to do everything we can to prevent their use. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for highlighting an issue and a dimension of this war, which is a blank spot in the majority narrative of this war. I think it's uh, very important to become aware uh, that this is an issue that is threatening not only Ukraine, but humanity. Uh, I come now to a more, I would say, concrete uh, part of our discussion, and I want to ask Roland Appel, uh, you have written in an article recently that both the German government and the EU have no exit strategy for the war in Ukraine. What do you think, what is the reason, why is that so, that they don't have an exit strategy, and how could such an exit strategy look like? Ja, vielen Dank, lieber Peter Wahl. Vielleicht noch. Thank you a lot, Peter Wahl. One more reason why I'm sitting here. So, behind this uh, radical democratic foundation, um, there's nothing else than the network of young socialists, which is working non parliamentary. I, I started working there with them when I was 17 and I learned that a lot of this basic work on the ground is more important than the one done in the parliaments. And by now I can really tell that this paid off in the end. It is majorly important that the parliaments are being pressurized from the ground. So my po first point um, that I observed in the time after this breach perpetrated by Putin. But I also see that there have been reasons and issues beforehand, and that there has been a militarization also of our society. I mean, you, you will see that if you start looking into political talk shows where there's always been presentation of like simple um, oppositions. I experienced, I don't know who knows that, um, that there has been a proposal signed uh, also by Alice Schwarzer which said, why are you not also thinking about the way of going into discussions and neg negotiations? These are all methods for me, which really go to the heart of the matter. Originally, I, I haven't been a peace activist, but an activist of civil society. So that's why I'm also really concerned with the inner structures um, 
battling the um, social gaps which we can see currently due to the increase in living costs and gas prices. So that's the reason that we shouldn't forget when we think about this war and when we think about how to um, stop it. So I fully um, uh, agree to what Taya has uh, said. So, but now I come to my critique of the German government and the EU. So there is no clarity what could be the aim or the goal of this war. So what's their strategy? What, what do the USA want? So for me there's a large difference when um, Olaf Scholz is saying that Putin shouldn't be allowed to win and uh, Ms. Baerbock is saying on the other side that the Ukraine has to win. So that's a huge difference for me. So this is some form of escalation that is being taken into account. And it seems to me that this is due to the lack of that there is no concept of what could be uh, an end of the war. And I don't see that in the ruling parties, I don't see that in the opposition anyway. So they are total failure in this part. And what's horrifying for me in the Green Party is, um, seems to have a Janus head. So, what they, what's happening on the one side uh, in the Ukraine and is being presented as a um, defense of our liberties and freedoms. But on the other side, if they don't even give a statement if um, regarding the issue of Julian Assange. I mean, I could, can understand the, the difficulties that uh, Mr. Habeck is in. But then he drives to, to the most horrifying um, uh, perpetrators uh, against human rights, for example, Putin and the Saudi Arabians. So what's happening there, this money from fracking gas, And regarding the supply chain laws, so I'm I'm really looking for like what kind of blood is sticking to that. So my old party member friends, and it, so that's the biggest lie that I've seen in that party so far in the last years. So what can we do? So we can do what we do right now. We have to talk to each other. We have to think together. We, so this small radical uh, network I'm coming from. That's where Don Peter Wald from too. So next week in Berlin, there will be an event. And it was really difficult to get people together would speak about who speak about pacifism on the one side and whether this is like completely detached of reality and I really uh, amazed by how some people were putting themselves in front of a tank in Ukraine but that's not a fully elaborated strategy against war but how this um, can be just completely disregarded by public and in, in public. Um, that's what we have to battle. And that's why we have to start this movement really from the ground, from the people. To highlight that there are different positions on the table as well. 
So that's why it's very important for me to think about a Europe after the war, a Europe with Russia. This country, no matter who is ruling there, and I'm totally certain, and I'm, I'm really unhappy, but it will probably be Putin. And we have to establish a peace order which contains all of Europe. I really cannot lay down the single steps. I'm not able to, to say anything about that in concrete. But that's this order where all can put down their interests has to be established. I really don't want to start now about NATO and that's all happened and we can't undo the past. But so far we only thought about Europe without excluding Russia. And what's happening currently is despite all the human rights abuses is part of a failed Western politic. But what I think didn't fail at all is the old paradigm that we were thinking about politics, international politics together with international economy. That's how it was running so far. And even now, like with all these struggles about the pipelines, the fact that there's still gas going through those pipelines is the one thing that stops the war from a total escalation. That has something to do, obviously, also with the world's climate. But I, I really want to warm to fall back to some esoteric fantasies. And, and now the US uh, finally recognizes the special um, co uh, competition to China after they've used them as cheap labor for the past years. Uh, when I my role as moderator mal misbrauch. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I want to abuse my role as a moderator and give a small uh, addition here regarding Willy Brandt. So there's a very interesting survey by the Friedrich Ebert Foundation from last week. So they were asking whether the German type of pacifism, you don't have to like that, but you know what I mean. So this focus on peace in the German population, whether this is a matter of the past or not anymore. So there was a representative survey and 62% of the German population still think that there was a right um, policy. So it seems to be there's a gap between the published opinion and the actual opinion of the people. So yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I should just speak a little slower and... Uh, oh, did I speak German? You see, uh, anyhow, um, we all are requested to speak slowly for the interpreters. Uh, now, the idea was of this panel to have, after these first statements, a second round. Uh, we will make this second round before we open the discussion to you with comments, questions and so on. And I ask now our four panelists to be clearly shorter, although they have to speak slowly. Yeah? And <laughs> so this is a contradiction, <laughs> I know. Uh, so the quadrature of the circle, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I want to ask one point 
for Sarah because I found it very, very interesting to highlight this nuclear issue that you can perhaps elaborate a bit more about that because we are witnessing tremendous changes in the military sector through new technologies, digitalization, automatization of warfare, robots that are uh, fighting and killing, mini nukes, mini nuclear uh, weapons and so on, hypersonic weapons. Is there not the risk that this has an impact on the nuclear balance of power, this famous or unfamous uh, mutual assured destruction? Thank you. And, 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 and please, slowly and short. I'll try. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so the question. There's no doubt that warfare techniques are evolving and have been for some time. As well as the list Peter mentioned then, we can add cyber attacks. We hear about some of the high profile ones, but smaller ones happen every day. We can add states setting up space forces. Indeed, it's not just the techniques that are evolving, but in the minds of policymakers, the very concept of how we fight war is changing. Traditional battlefields where two enemies face off are now supplemented by new, more shadowier technologies. Cyber attacks, state on state, on crucial state infrastructure is now a reality. Drones can bomb and kill people thousands of miles away in a process that has been likened to a computer game. Biological warfare is now being identified by the doomsday clock scientists as a very real developing threat. And then artificial intelligence poses ethical and security concerns about where taking humans out of that decision-making process could lead, and this potentially even in the use of a nuclear weapon. And a huge issue of concern for peace activists across the world at the moment is the militarization of space. The US has created a space force, the UK has created a space command, and billions of euros is being spent by countries around the world on militarizing space. In fact, without us almost noticing, warfare has become almost totally dependent on using space technology. Conflict between states is now subject to increasingly complex and ever-changing factors. And the really dangerous element of this is that these developments have happened without hardly any scrutiny, not by parliaments, not by opposition leaders, not by the public, not by think tanks. And I th actually think that in many cases, campaigners, academics, we have been a bit slow to catch up with the reality of what's going on. I mentioned mini nukes or tactical nuclear weapons as they're called in my first contribution. As I said then, even though technically the load is less powerful, the very idea of them could actually be making wars, such as the one in Ukraine, more dangerous due to the way we talk about them. People call them usable nuclear weapons, but what does that mean? They're going to kill slightly less people? But the impact of a nuclear weapon remains. The radiation travels with the wind and has repercussions far beyond what was originally intended. But to come back to the question, and to try and condense it as quickly as possible, what amazes me at the end of the day about this increased technologization is that, have they actually changed war? Have they actually changed international relations fundamentally? Because in theory, you would think that they would make nuclear weapons redundant. All the trends are leading towards precision-based weapons. We can hit that target, that location. We're not going to target innocent people. But the very premise of nukes is that they're indiscriminatory. They're going to destroy a city. But yet, we still hang on to them. Despite all these developments, everything we've just talked about, let's look at the war in Ukraine. To me, it seems like a brutal ground war like others before it. Tanks, trenches, civilian casualties, ordinary people conscripted and killed as soldiers, homes destroyed, fleeing refugees? How have all these new developments in weaponry that's meant to make us more sophisticated changed that? Has anything fundamental changed since 1945? 
or are we just stuck as an international order? Yes, new technologies may be creating new threats and new ways of prodding and attacking each other, but at the end of the day, we come back to the same situation as 1945, when nuclear weapons remain that ultimate threat hanging over everything else. This ultimate weapon that would destroy on a level unmatched by anything humanity has seen so far. And what is any world leader doing to resolve that? It may be that we can get too wrapped up in the technologies of war, the methods used, the weapons chosen. But however we wage war, it still kills people. It still has to be stopped as a method of solving disputes for the good of and perhaps the preservation of our planet. So we need to remember that and remember that fundamental concept. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and also thank you for being so short. Uh, there is a lot of work ahead for us uh, because there are new challenges and we have to deal with something that we don't like at all. Uh, we don't like arms, we don't like wars, but we are obliged uh, to understand them, how they work, how they function, and uh, I mean you have given us the task to do so in the future. Uh, I want now uh, to come to Yuri. Yuri, you can hear us, um, and uh, I... Uh, have heard in your first statement that you are quite pessimistic with the mood and the, the uh, attitudes in the Ukrainian society. Uh, I want to ask you, we have had in Germany a similar situation with France. Mm -hmm. For more than 200 years there was an enemicity and, and there was the the enemy as such, since the times of Napoleon, of course, until to 1945. Horrible things uh, in the perception of each country uh, to the other one, like between Russians and Ukraine today. But today, many people in particular, those who are born after World War, even don't know about that, yeah, these horrible times. My question is now, do you see any perspectives uh, of Ukraine and Russia to come to the same situation as we are today with France and uh, Germany? And do you see a way or at least a step towards such a solution of this deep-rooted hatred between countries? And please be short and slow. Uh, yes, uh, uh, please give me 10 minutes to answer. I prefer this future without armies, borders and wars, where both Ukrainians and Russians will be happy members of large family of all humans, sharing common land, our mother planet Earth. This kind of territorial integrity, Kiev, Crimea, Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, Odessa, united on the one planet, ruled by people-friendly non-violent government is the most worthy. Idea of absolute power of one violent government over some territory is from the Dark Ages. This militarized sovereignty should be abandoned. And this old unfair formula of governance, divide and rule, which produces bloodshed and fictional enemy images, should be universally condemned. So first of all, people should stop trust militarist rhetoric about impossibility of peace talks with enemy. When you hear Russian fairy tales about hegemonic Western empire of lies, or when you hear Western fairy tales about a couple of made dictators ruining the world, just ask who profits from the universal militarized economic structure, which wages war on people's common sense and incentivizes media to spread such a nonsense. Militant leaders of Russia and Ukraine, along with their allies in the East and West, in their official propaganda, are focusing on demonized images of enemy and unrealistic plans to end the war by complete victory. This narrative is obviously false and should be changed towards values of peace and justice to deal with misdoings on both sides by repentance, accountability and prevention to end the war by reconciliation. Worldwide peace movement should, uh, could change the narrative by telling the truth, informing and educating people 
for peace advocating ceasefire, peace talks between East and West, as well as Russia and Ukraine, and systemic transition uh, to economy and politics of nonviolence. Good examples of this work are diplomatic efforts of United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, humanitarian and spiritual uh, anti-war initiatives of uh, scholars, of uh, philosophers, of uh, religious uh, uh, um, uh, figures such as Pope Francis, reports of human rights violations on both sides published by United Nations Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights and Amnesty International, as well as idea uh, of neg negotiated peace agreement proposed by experts in conflict management. For example, by Friedrich Glasel, uh, and, and for example, United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network um, statement. It is important to point out that war crimes and serious human rights violations are committed on both sides of this war. Uh, as was observed in the reports of uh, uh, UN human rights bodies and civil society organizations such as Amnesty International. It is not equalization of aggressor and victim, not justification for aggression, not Russian propaganda. It is just a fact that any war, including so-called defensive war, violates human rights that both sides uh, currently failed to comply with norms of international law, starting from U uh, United Nations Charter, which demands peaceful resolution of disputes. And true victim is not militarist, authoritarian, right-wing populist government of Ukraine or Russia, very similar governments, not any armies which are part of systemic violence. True victims are civilians on both sides, in Ukraine, in Russia, and everywhere in the world, uh, in all countries suffering from war, robbed of their welfare, hopes for better future, democracy, and right to know truth. An example of battle around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, we see how recklessly both sides behave. Russian army took control of it, turning into a target, and Ukrainian army attacks it. Ukrainian Ministry of Defense admitted at least one attack with killer drones, and I can't trust the official version of our army about Russian forces shelling themselves on nuclear power plant. Uh, United Nations proposal to turn nuclear power plant into the de demilitarized zone is the best idea. Uh, that should be done. But both belligerents are not willing to give up ambitions of military control over this civilian object. Despite uh, uh, IAEA warns about risks for nuclear safety and many experts, not to say regular people, fear that uh, this mess could lead to serious accident and large radioactive contamination. You know, one of our members uh, of Ukrainian pacifist movement lives in the city of Marganets on the bank of Dnipro River opposite to Enerhadar. He hears all horrible <coughs> sounds of this combat. He asked permission to leave the place of residence as the law demands, uh, uh, but uh, military authorities refused to give him such a permission. The army of Ukraine needs so-called reserve of serfs, let's call things by their names, for compulsory military service and in case of compulsory work such as digging trenches. Both sides of Russia-Ukraine conflict are unwilling to stop shooting and start talking both convinced their uh, winning in war of attrition. And uh, there are publicly discussed plans to prolong war for years, insane plans, if you didn't realize that some stakeholders are eager to gain more power and profits at the cost of human lives and suffering. Since belligerents currently have structural and situational incentives for their bellicosity, these incentives should be removed or better replaced with positive incentives for peace process, appealing to hope for gains rather than fear of losses. Because the war economy raised level of tolerance for threats and pains. Recent Istanbul agreement on shipment of grain and other agricultural goods from Ukraine via the Black Sea shows that positive incentives like mutual interest in profit from trade are working, especially under international pressure of starving global south. This example, as well as example of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, showed that sane people of the world can raise voices, mobilize governments and international organizations 
to resist reckless militarist policies of great powers and war industries hurting all humankind and endangering common future of all people on earth. Western governments uh, should rethink uh, uh, this uh, uh, policies. Western governments think uh, that war could be ended with regime change in Russia. Russian governments think uh, that uh, regime change in Ukraine could end this war. But such regime changes, if even possible, could not stop the war. Only profound global structural change uh, will do it. And I believe unfolding worldwide peace movement will cause necessary changes. Three main goals of worldwide peace movement should be uphold human right to refuse to kill, stop all wars and build peace. The human right to refuse to kill uh, uh, should be defended. Uh, the most needed things to stop war between Russia and Ukraine are investment into peace education and peace journalism to change narrative of eternal and just war to the narrative of necessary reconciliation uh, and uh, uh, expo uh, uh, exposure of human rights violating war caused by not enemy but by archaic worldwide militarization of economy. Uh, uh, support of peace movement in Ukraine and Russia uh, is needed, uh, and in the whole world is needed, uh, in all ways, moral and material. We need insist on comprehensive and inclusive worldwide peace process, building peaceful uh, relations between all people, not only in Russia and Ukraine, uh, but in all countries of East and West. We need to expose and abolish militarized sovereignties and build united, nonviolent political community of humankind with autonomous but interdependent cultural autonomies without this hegemonic sovereign ambitions of the past, united nonviolent uh, world governance additionally to world <coughs> markets. Thanks to nature, we already have united world market and no economic warfare, no sanctions and hate could split it. Uh, uh, many talented organizers on world market and uh, uh, we need to engage them uh, in peace movement. We need to build nonviolent society, uh, uh, so better world without wars, armies and borders. A lot of work is ahead. Of course, without this work, we will have also big changes for wars instead of big changes for good. And indeed, after several years of bloodshed, extreme mutual weakening of Russia and Ukraine in this pointless and senseless war, recklessly incentivized by weapon supply from NATO countries to Ukraine, could also lead to negotiations. Yeah. But uh, it would be peace on graveyard, not victory of common sense and peace movement, not yeah. the only viable option of win-win. I am concluding. Yeah. If uh, loud uh, voices of civilians suffering from war and military spending inflation, hunger, decline of social and economic yeah, welfare, yeah. these You're voices right. of suffering civilians are not heard. Warmongering leaders could yeah. not be trusted and should be changed, but change of leadership is not enough. Yeah. Uh, all militarized economy uh, should be dismantled. We need new social contract and right. non-violent democratic governance and abolition of war. The sooner we stop shooting and start talking, the better. You're all right. You're right. people in the world uh, last sentence. All peace-loving people in the world should demand immediate ceasefire and peace talks in one common voice of massive yeah. omnipresent peace movement. Yeah. As in 1990s, millions yes. took Yuri, streets Yuri, throughout Yuri, the world, Yuri, Yuri, nuclear war, uh, war and insisted on disarmament. <laughs> 80% of nuclear stockpiles. Yuri, you have heard the applause in the room. Your message has come through. One people of Earth, like one family. Yuri, thank, thank you. and need to do it again. Thank you very much. Yuri, thank you. Uh, stay connected. And sorry, and sorry stay connected, and maybe there uh, might come some questions or comment from the public to you. So please uh, stay connected. Thank you. Uh, we are now in trouble with time, so I would ask you uh, for one issue that is, in my opinion, quite important, but a very short answer. Uh, and this is a question of the role of morality in this whole question of war. You have criticized in the article I mentioned at the beginning your party friend and our foreign minister, Mrs. Baerbock, um, that she is too moralistic. What do you mean and 
What could be an alternative if you see it critical? Ich glaube, da habe ich schon meinem ersten I believe I have already said enough about that in my first statement. Foreign policy has to take care of the bringing interests um, in compromise with each other. And you can't bring morals into this too much. It's the wrong way of doing it. In my way, that's a dead end. I would ask for a very well political way of doing things, we have to recognize that however this war is going to end, which is hopefully going to be soon, that in Europe, Russia needs to be a partner of Europe and that economical work with Europe, will, with Russia, will continue existing after the war, after a possibly very long term peace conference there's going to be uh, which could end in a demilitarized zone and we also have to talk about the question of how can we transition to peace how can we even get to a ceasefire um, maybe there's even going to be a new Iron Curtain in Europe. I can't exclude that, but we have to talk about it. And both institutions, the German government and the EU, need to work towards that happening soon. Because I can only say one thing. Think about this. If Trump will be in power again in two years, then all your weapons supplying and all your strategy that you have now, you can just pack it all in, because maybe there's going to be a whole different kind of conflict on this planet, especially when it comes to the ecological destruction. And that's why there's no alternative to acting and to thinking. But please, don't start to talk about delaying weapons deliveries. There was a attempt of importing medical supplies to Ukraine. That is so difficult because all of the bureaucracy and of um, transport would not be a problem, but that's how you can see how complicated it is. And many journalists who would, it looks like to me, who would like to get into the war zone themselves, themselves, they should get more competent about these things. And one last thing, we as Germans and as Europeans need to start thinking differently. I can't understand how the G7 states, I have only looked at their body language there, it was so dominant and I found it gross how some of them were looking down on some of the Indonesian people that were there. That reminded me of the Mafia. There are some states, Brazil, India, Russia, China. Uh, they are the rising states. And G7 and the US need to realize that and if they don't, uh, they're going to have a rude awakening. Um, you can read an interview from the South African Foreign Minister. You can learn a lot from that. And uh, the public has not yet uh, had the opportunity to discuss. Tarja, are you still connected? Yes. Yes. Do, do you pardon me if I don't give you the floor not to you at this moment and give you the opportunity at the end to speak for another two or three minutes? Could you pardon me? Maybe there might be questions because uh, we have run out of time. Oh, okay. Well, I am... Um I could uh, use the two minutes now and, and then you can... Uh, okay, 
Okay. Questions. Would okay. that be okay? Because I have to leave. Okay. Okay. Then let's do this one. Give us a last minute, uh, message of two minutes. Uh, you have the floor. Yes, and I think uh, <clears throat> I have been listening, and I I know the discussion, and I agree with the fact that the people have to actually uh, re require now peace, and and also I agree even in Finland. The democracy has been the first victim of the Ukrainian war. But I would still like to end with an optimistic note on three points. First of all, research on nuclear weapons has actually shown that it's not at the times when there are no nuclear problems or no nuclear threats that the good treaties are made. The good treaties just the ABM treaty, the INF treaty, and others were made at times of very heightened tension. And so I, I think it is also up to us who are working with these treaties to actually understand that this is the time when you have to change. You have to change the NPT. It's absurd that the conference is meeting for one month and nothing new comes out of it, not even the Russian uh, <clears throat> condemnation of, of the threats. So I would like to refer to a new treaty which has not been mentioned in the discussion so far. It's the Treaty on the prohibi Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. States, non-nuclear states, in 15-16 took an initiative and actually uh, there was a UN treaty uh, approved in 2017 on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. It has entered into force, and it's also now part of the international law. So 80 nations, little over 80 nations has, have signed it, and more than 50 have ratified it. So my point is also that we should really give this um, treaty a lot of support and work in all our countries that our countries will sign this treaty. So this would mean the prohibition of nuclear weapons. There's not time to go more into that. And finally, I would <clears throat> like to say something about European security structures. After the uh, Cold War and the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, there were these discussions of what is the role of NATO and how can we uh, design new structures. Russia has been fairly active in, in promoting this, which all the Western countries have, have sort of ignored. And <clears throat> I was working together with the Carnegie Foundation in the US, and I talked about my own contracts, contacts over the border in, with Russia. I worked for <clears throat> six years developing a, short, a soft border between Russia and Finland. It's, of course, now gone. But uh, <clears throat> the Carnegie person said to me that you have to stick to your Russian contacts now. There will not be any new contacts because of this isolation, because of the sanctions, and because of the escalation that these two things uh, bring with them. But there is a point in time where we have to start discussing with Russia, where, where it is very important to know what's happening in Russia, how the Russians think, and where could we find sort of a a security structure for, for Europe that has to include all European countries. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me. Thank you very much to you, Daria. Uh, you have heard the applause of these some 200 people here in the room. Uh, we thank you very much for having been with us, and I wish you uh, success uh, in spite of the difficult situation in the negotiation. Have a good time. So, thank you. Bye yeah, bye. Bye bye. Uh, now we can open the discussion to the public. We have, unfortunately, to end our meeting sharp because the buses for the activist type of the style of uh, the university is, uh, are waiting at four o'clock. So please, two minutes maximum uh, for comments, questions and so on. There are micros in the first row on both sides of the room. So those who want to speak, please come forward. Oh, so a Massenansturm. Uh, I, I'm surprised. I'm. Su
<laughs> I'm so um, here on the podium, on the panel, there are questions or comments or arguments that you feel should be now presented. But, uh, uh, there is somebody. Oh, very much. Thank you very much. Uh, hi. When I speak in German, uh, the others understand me in, in the chat? Yes, I okay, think then, so. Uh, then I'm Deutsch. Okay, I'm going to speak in German. Thank you for explaining all of this. I am with you. And I often have discussions about how can we make peace without weapons, which has been a struggle in these last months. And often I feel that in the end it is just not satisfying the kind of answers you come up with. Cooperation, sanctions, being cooperative um, also in an economical sense. Maybe you could talk more in detail about certain arguments that one could bring up in arguments like that. What is the concrete idea about making peace without weapons? What would that mean, for example, in Germany, concretely? How can disarmament in Germany or the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, how can that happen? How can this vision be broadened? How can we make peace? Okay. There on the right now. Ja, also ich will in Deutsch sprechen. I am also speaking in German. And I wanted to ask, shouldn't we think about what is the fair position in the Ukraine Russia war which um of the Russian ideas are fair? What is important for them um for their long-term needs, um, for having an ice-free harbor. Um, if it happens that things break down in Europe, what we have to think about what would be a fair solution. Uh, and when it comes to weapons supply, um, what can we allow for Russia to have and and the people on the on the ground have to be able to decide about that. I am also speaking German. Birgit Kevis from Aachen. I wanted to ask about the role of the climate movement, which has been so strong in the last years, because it is clear if there isn't an international cooperation now but a Cold War then we can forget about the goals of the climate movement. Once the Greenland ice has molten, once the Gulf Stream has stopped, that is going to have consequences for hundreds of generations. Why are people so short-sighted? Uh, I would like to agree with my um, previous speaker, another question. If we have a little chance of getting out of this ecological crisis, then we have to, at the same time, exit any kind of military thinking. We are in a time where there is no alternative to pacifism. Roland, you and I know each other from the Green Party. We have discussed the idea of social defense as an alternative. And where is that discussion now? And then we can on. Thank you, Tumor, on this side. Rolf Beierling from Köln, Attack. I am thinking about when it comes to escalation, what is the topic of um, 
So when we talk about the uh, possibility of a demilitary zone uh, guaranteed by all parties, could that be a solution to stop further destruction? Um, it could be a solution that is also okay for the opposing side. What possibilities do you see to work here with the US, with Biden? How do you feel about this? How did you see the US in this question of the neutrality of Ukraine? The question is uh, to Tabea in New York, who is not in the line anymore. Okay, I'm asking anyways. I found it really sad that in this war, Sweden and Finland have become NATO members and I would be interested, was this a uh, sizing of opportunity? And have these countries finally found a reason to get into NATO and, so to speak, um, broke the resistance of the people? And I wonder, are there movements in these countries against this membership? Maybe you know something about that. Okay, I am now asking the panel. Sarah? What kind of question would you like? You the priority to start? I just start. Yes. Okay. Start. Okay. So yeah. Thank you for the thank you for the questions and comments. So at the end there and the lady's question, you mentioned the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and where do we even start with getting these countries to sign it? And of course, even though it's a, this treaty is supported by 122 countries in the world but it's still looking impossible at the moment. It's very, very difficult at least to get the nuclear armed countries and the nuclear hosting countries to sign it. But there are things we can do, sort of practical things. So in the UK, um, we're leading a campaign to get local authorities to support the treaty. If the national government won't support it, we'll build the pressure from below. So already we have Glasgow, Manchester, Norwich, Oxford, and many, many smaller um, countries. We're working on London. So internationally, Washington has supported it. Paris has supported it. And I think uh, many German towns and cities have as well. And there will be campaigns going on here as they are in France. So if they won't listen from above, we can do things from below on a grassroots level just to pile on the pressure, as, but while keeping up that national pressure as well. Um, and then someone else mentioned the role of climate movement. I mean, in every way, absolutely agree with this premise. Number one, I mean, the planet, the future of the planet is just the most urgent task facing us all, and we should all be supporting that. But also, you know, intersectionality, without campaigns supporting each other, we're nothing, we're nowhere. All problems today are connected. Um, Climate change and nuclear weapons just play an important role in each other. Producing nuclear weapons produce it, and the military in general produces huge CO2 emissions. Any nuclear detonation would massively affect the climate, and it's up to us to make those connections. And in the UK, we've been working with school strikers, with Extinction Rebellion, and it's by getting sort of our messages through to each other's audiences that we build a stronger case for changes in the end. So they're the ones that I would immediately address. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there was the question which is very important, the role of the United States. I would ask uh, Roland uh, to come in. And Yuri, uh, would you be able to say something on the NATO membership of Finland and Sweden? But before I give the floor to Roland. Ja, ich äh, habe keine Ursachenforschung betrieben, aber I Okay, I haven't studied the courses. But I think one of the reasons for Finland and Sweden to enter the NATO was that they were scared of Putin. That might have been something populist, but in my eyes it's also something very consequential. I think it's something that Putin didn't expect. 
And now it happened. The big rule of the United States. I already said that I completely agree with my colleague from Finland to wait for an... We need to quickly convince the United States. But then I'm not sure whether the United States will actually manage to convince themselves of retreating a bit. Because at the moment the United States are against war and they decided not to interfere. Whereas we also we also have to exert pressure onto the European institutions. And that is where I believe that we need a new climate movement. These movements have always worked with each other. In Bonn in the 70s, the people were the same protesting as they were two years later against uh, rearming the state. So we have to take this into consideration that we need to unite the movements. And I see that this is happening. We see that this networking has taken up. There are always people who talk about the differences. Some always say that someone working with Riders for Future is for nuclear powers. I believe that it's not about what single members of the movements think. I think we have to focus on the big arguments, on the main arguments. We can only change something if we do focus on climate change and if we manage to somehow award this crisis. We won't manage to keep our 1.5% goal, but that's not a reason to that's not a reason not to act. We still have to stop what is happening in the Ukraine. If we don't act now, then others will act. I do not see any alternative to acting now. We've been asked who acts here. There is an international movement working towards peace. There are people working towards us as an international league for human rights that was founded in 1904, another one founded in 1915. There are many of those movements and foundations that are still active. There's a peace office in Bonn, there, is, there are international doctors against nuclear war, all of which will have something to say on all these topics. All I can say is what well, we do have the internet, just get a move on and act. I have a friend who... <laughs> what all I can say about the Green Party is that they only act when somebody makes them act. Kasseler Friedensratschlag and uh, in Frankfurt there is uh, the Zukunftswerkstatt uh, for peace. Uh, so there are a lot of organizations and there is an initiative underway now uh, for demonstrations uh, in October uh, and there are processes of self-organization at uh, several points and spots of the society and I'm sure that uh, this will make progress uh, in the next month. I have now a last question. Yuri, can you elaborate in two minutes on the Finland and Sweden question? What are your opinion? What's your opinion about that? Uh, I will say shortly this and uh, some other questions. Two minutes, okay. Uh, uh, Pity and Dvorin, uh, Finland and Sweden, uh, caught epidemic militarism. NATO is marketing department of arms industry. It should be abolished this whole war system and arms industry. And uh, uh, sooner or later, uh, Finland and Sweden uh, and whole the world will return to welfare instead of bloodshed. Uh, now, uh, there was a question how to achieve peace. You know, any war finishes with peace talks. It is very realistic and true. It is a bad idea that thinking and talking is not action. It is delusion that only violence is effective. Peaceful thinking, peace talks and peaceful assemblies uh, in support uh, to peace by peaceful means is the most concrete ways to achieve peace. Now, uh, about fairness, what would be fair solution? 
you know, morality was mentioned. Uh, uh, I should remind you uh, that uh, uh, the best morality is based on a simple idea. You should not kill. Uh, war is not moral. Uh, and a uh, uh, fair solution uh, would be uh, to uh, uh, resolve this conflict not in interests of warmongering governments of Russia and Ukraine. Russia uh, as militarist government, Ukraine as militarist government, uh, is not worthy. Only peace-loving people in Russia, in Ukraine, in all the world uh, should be uh, a benefit from solution. So we should dismantle system of militarism. Uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, ideas of uh, uh, participation uh, of climate movement and peace movement, it is a great idea. Uh, 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 there was unity uh, of uh, peace movement, uh, human rights movement, ecological movements, and we should restore these historical links. Because all peace-loving people uh, who believe that war is not green, uh, who believe that war violates human rights and so on, should unite and uh, demand uh, to stop waging senseless wars. And in the United States, uh, someone mentioned the United States, there are a lot of peace-loving people. Uh, just visit the site worldbeyondwar.org. You can find a lot of uh, information about many peace actions throughout the world. Uh, you can find uh, uh, very clear and short explanations why, why uh, war can't be just, war can't be inevitable, uh, war can be beneficial, and so on. Uh, and also, uh, alternative non-violent global security system, uh, great brochure, you can also find on this website. So uh, let's uh, build uh, peace on Earth together, uh, a better non-violent society. Without big changes, wars will not stop. We need to change a global social contract uh, and uh, uh, uphold our non-violent way of life. No good alternative to this exists. Thank you very much, uh, Yuri. Uh, we say goodbye to you in Kiev. Uh, you can stay still connected because I give uh, for the last time the floor uh, to Sara so that she can conclude uh, the meeting. Yeah. But you, Yuri, thank you very much again uh, for your courageous statement, and I wish you. We all wish you here the best uh, for your future work in Ukraine. And now uh, you will close the meeting. <laughs> no pressure then. Um, so I just think a very general statement to end. Uh, everywhere we look, it's quite obvious we're in a time of crisis. The war in Ukraine, as we've discussed today, but also this is just one conflict taking place across the world. I mean, let's, let's look at Yemen. Let's look at the ongoing civil war in Syria. There's conflict and trouble everywhere we turn. Financially, you know, I'm not young. I graduated 16 years ago and still the economic system hasn't recovered to what it was before the 2008 crash. And now there's another cost of living crisis. Um, people can't afford homes. People can't afford to heat themselves, to eat in, in the winter. And then there's this huge existential threat of climate change. Will the planet still be here for generations to come? So there is a lot going on, and I understand that in the middle of all that, we, we can forget about some things, but I would just urge everyone here not to forget about nuclear weapons. They still exist. They still pose a unique danger to humanity, unlike any other weapon. And I would just ask you, in your organizations, be that a trade union, be that a educational establishment, be that a political party, do not forget about these weapons. They're in Germany. France has nuclear weapons, Britain has nuclear weapons, so please include opposition to these horrendous weapons of mass destruction in your organization's program of work. That would be my last request to you, so thank you everyone. I have nothing to add to that except to thank the technicians who have provided a really functioning, well technical equipment. I have to thank the interpreters. <laughs> thank you very much. You have worked hard. And I thank, of course, all our participants in the panel. 
and I wish you an interesting continuation of the summer university and if you go back on Monday, I hope you will take initiatives for peace and disarmament. All the best. Thanks to organizers for this amazing event.